Interrompemos esse podcast para perguntar quem você quer ser? Designer. Engenheira. Pedagoga. Administrador. Quer saber? O Senac EAD é a nota máxima no MEC. Tem cursos de diversas áreas, com conteúdo elaborado por especialistas do mercado e professores mestres e doutores. Ainda tem o Senac Carreiras, conectando estudantes a vagas de emprego em todo o país. Saiba mais em iad.senac.br graduação. Pausa rapidinho agora para falar de dica de ouro para os papais e mamães. Depois de experimentar a nova Hug Supreme Care Fralda Roupinha, tudo ficou ainda melhor para o meu filho. É a única com canais em X que se adaptam aos movimentos, com duas vezes proteção noturna e cintura elástica que se adapta ao corpinho do bebê, além de ser super fácil de colocar e tirar. Praticidade pura. Então guarda essa dica. Nova Hug Supreme Care Fralda Roupinha. Bebê, estamos juntos nessa, mais do que nunca. Agora curta seu podcast. Dave? Yes, Holly. This is going to be a hell of an awesome show. I this is our first interview with film talent, producers, directors, and I do not think we could have started off with a better film. Yeah, this is fun. And we're going to be talking to the producer and director of the new adaptation to the movie Valley Girl. Is They it? refer to it as a, a reimagining. Okay. So this is a reimagining of the 1983 film Valley Girl. So go ahead, Holly, tell us who we are going to talk to. We're talking to Stephen Wolf, one of the producers, and Rachel Lee Goldenberg, the director. So let's get started with our talk with producer Stephen Wolf. I'm one of the producers. There's two of us. Oh, um, Matt Smith is my producing partner. And, um, and Matt, it's actually, it was actually Matt's idea many years ago to turn Valley Girl um, into a movie, or into a movie musical, maybe over 10 years ago. And um, I came into it a little bit later in the mix, eight years ago, through one of my uh, contacts at MGM, somebody that I had uh, worked with uh, named Cassidy Lang, and she was the uh, exec overseeing Valley Girl at MGM. And she brought me into this, uh, into this. She called me one day and asked me if I would read it. You know, she said she was working on this film and wanted to get my thoughts about it. And uh, I said, uh, what is it? And she said, uh, It's a musical remake of Valley Girl. And I was, I literally was like, uh, send it to me now. I'm going to read it tonight. Um, I was so excited about the idea because um, Valley Girl, the original, was one of my favorites of the 80s. And I was pretty young, just starting my career at that time. And I still remember going to a screening of the original Valley Girl at the Writers Guild Theater in Beverly Hills before it had been released. I still remember sitting there. It was such a fantastic movie. And the chemistry between Nicolas Cage, who nobody knew who he was at that time, and Deborah Foreman was just like, you know, off the charts, really. And so I, I can remember coming out and just like this buzz in the uh, lobby of the, the Writers Guild, and everybody was going nuts over this movie. And, you know, and of course it went on to be a huge, big hit. And I loved the film, and I was actually really fortunate to be involved in Deborah Foreman's next movie, which was a movie called My Chauffeur. Um, I worked at a company called Crown International Pictures back all through the 80s. That's kind of where I got my, my chops and learned how to become a producer. I worked for Mark and Marilyn Denser, who were the owners of Crown International. And I started as an assistant uh, working on, on a movie called My Tutor in 1982, which also was a huge, huge hit, runaway hit film. I started as, as a, a production assistant and I became Marilyn Tenser's assistant. A couple of years later, I was producing and one of the films that I made, I was technically credited as the production manager on a movie called uh, My Chauffeur, although I really produced that movie um, along with Marilyn. And Debbie Foreman was was the star right off of Valley Girl. Um, and she and I became really good friends and we've maintained a friendship all these years. And it was just great to work with her. So when MGM called me and said they were making a Valley Girl remake as a musical, you know, not only did I always want to make a musical, but the original Valley Girl was such a 
uh, a favorite of mine and Debbie Foreman was a friend. And there was just like a million reasons I was excited about reading it. And I did. I literally read it overnight. And I think I called Cassidy the next day and said, I'm, whatever you need, I'm in. I want to be part of this. Here we are. It's finally coming out. So, sort of coming out. Um, our, our, the, the, the COVID crisis, unfortunately, took away our, our theatrical run. But uh, interestingly enough, this week, they've started actually adding some uh, drive-in movie theaters back into the mix. And I think I think The Valley Girl is a perfect movie. Uh, and hopefully it will, you know, it will do well in spite of our missing out on our theatrical, mostly missing out on our theatrical Anyway, that was a long and yeah, short introduction. <laughs> Again, we are with Stephen Wolf, the producer of Valley Girl. So welcome. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, uh, you're welcome. Yeah. We might as well touch on, I mean, you, you saw Valley Girl when you were in the, your 20s. Did you grow up in the Valley or did you grow up in Los I Angeles? I did, actually. Okay. I'm a Valley, I'm a valley boy, <laughs> so to speak. I grew up in Sherman Oaks. I went to Dixie Canyon Avenue Elementary School. So, and then I went to, let's see, I went to uh, Millican Junior High School for a year. Then my, <laughs> then my parents moved us up in the hills in Tarzana. And I ended up going to Portola Junior High School for the rest of junior high. And, uh, and then I went to uh, Taft High School in Woodland Hills. So I have quite a valley experience. Um, it was definitely nice a different world. <laughs> Different world back then before we had internet and things like that. I laugh now when I think about, you know, moving from one side of the valley as a young teen was traumatic because we didn't have internet back then. And so you literally lost your friends because they were now going to different schools and, you know, it's hard. I don't think kids would really understand this today, but we had to ask permission to use the telephone um, <laughs> because there was, you know, one in the house and it wasn't cheap to make phone calls. And it was, you know, not something our parents like wanted us doing, hanging out on the phone all the time. So uh, it's funny because I'm, I'm back in touch with so many people that I grew up with in the Valley through Internet over the last many, you know, 20 years, 15, 20 years or whatever we've all found each other again, which is great. And so it's very, very different. But uh, yes, I grew up in the Valley. Uh, my first jobs were working in movie theaters in the Valley. Um, I worked at the um, uh, General Cinema in Calabasas was my very first job while I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And then I also worked out at the UA Movie 6 in North Hollywood in the late 70s. I was a projectionist. I was a, a ticket taker. I worked concessions. Um, I was an usher. During the summer of Greece, Heaven Can Wait, The Goodbye Girl, and The Rescuers. So all four of those <laughs> movies were playing were playing in the Sixplex, which was the biggest gross crappy theater, by the way, and it's still operational. It's, still, it's a dollar fifty um, theater now. I think is that the one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was a, it was a novelty back then. <laughs> Um, because there hadn't been cineplexes, and that was the biggest grossing theater in the United States when I worked there in that summer. We had lines of thousands of people <laughs> at the box office from like 9 in the morning until midnight. Every single show, all six theaters sold out every performance day and night. I mean, all summer. I can still remember the lines and were taking tickets by hand, making change by hand, um, and just one right after another, you know, just like, you know, thousands of people filing through and you just, you know, every hour you got a five minute break to uh, reconcile your box office and then move on. It was really something. And drive-in theaters were still a thing back then. So I think it's funny that we're going to um, end up playing this movie in drive-in theaters. Because um, that was a really fun experience that a lot of people don't get anymore. So you you hit on something. You talked about this be, the original being pre internet times, and I just re I hadn't seen the movie in a few years, so I rewatched it yesterday, and I that was the, probably the first thing I thought about about how I'm curious to see how these things are going to be addressed. You know, in the new film, things things simple as he didn't get her phone number. You know, when, right. he, when he got kicked out of the party, you know, right. how's he going to get, you know, how, how would he get, get in touch with her? And, you know, other things like about calling your parents to pick you, you know, your parents picking you up from somewhere or how, yeah, you know, I telling mean, them when you you're going to be home. You know, it's funny because when I started uh, my career in the film business was in the early 80s. 
And I used to have to carry like rolls of quarters with me everywhere I went, because if I needed to make a phone call, sometimes I'd be stuck at a pay phone um, and you'd have to drop quarters in, you know, like if I had to call my boss or something like that. Um, I remember in the sometime in the mid 80s, I was shooting a movie in Malibu and I used to have to drive like forever to go to a pay phone to call into the office. And I'd sit there with the quarters feeding, you know, feeding the uh, machine and everything, the phone. And it, I don't even remember the last time I saw an actual pay phone anywhere. And if I did, it probably had graffiti all over it and it was scratched up and certainly nothing I would ever put my ear to um, in today's day and age. <laughs> So, yeah, it's funny. Uh, very different. Very So much simpler times in many ways. Sometimes I miss some of that, you know. Like I, I do, I, I have to say, sometimes I miss it being per permissible to like end my day at the end of work. And if somebody couldn't find me, it was okay until the next day. <laughs> yeah. Then you, <laughs> you were going to be in at 8 o'clock too. Yeah, you know, exactly. So. Or they would leave me a message on my message machine, which was a novelty back then. <laughs> You know, but you might not get it until you got home at midnight or something like that. And, you know, so you wouldn't necessarily be calling somebody back until the next day. So yeah. very, very different times. I mean, obviously, many of the things that we have with technology today are fantastic. And many of them are not <laughs> at the end of the day. That's true. <laughs> As a Valley guy, did you, you were a movie fan. Were you a music fan? Did you travel to Hollywood? What were your experiences going into the well, city outside as a Valley boy, suddenly going into the big city of Hollywood, the dirty, you gritty know, the streets? Funny, the funny thing is a lot of the reason I think I remember identifying with the original Valley girl was the whole idea of Hollywood being dangerous. <laughs> and I, you know, when I was a kid, I was completely obsessed. I, I always wanted to work in the film business, first of all. I mean, I started making Super 8 movies when I was, I think, in junior high school, maybe. Something like that. And I, I, it's all I ever wanted to do. I used to go to the movies with my parents to the Van Nuys Drive-In or the Sepulveda Drive-In. And, you know, I remember, like, you know, we had a station wagon and they would put down the seats in the back and we'd have our, our uh, uh, sleeping blanket and, uh, and we'd watch James Bond movies or uh, whatever, whatever my, usually what my parents wanted to see, we were just probably incidental in the back. Um, but I, I used to love going to the drive-in. There was something that clicked with me at the time about movies and, you know, and I just really, I don't know, some, uh, maybe it was a complete escape. Um, but I always like felt great when I was watching a movie and I, always wanted to make a movie and I used to take a bus um, unbeknownst to my parents I think it was the 71 if I remember was the number it was either 71 or 91 I can't remember a long Ventura Boulevard into Hollywood and we were actually forbidden from going to Hollywood because it was dangerous and my parents didn't want us there but I used to do it anyway I used to just take the bus and I used to um wander around Hollywood. Um, I just found it like so fascinating and the movie palaces, which were in pretty bad shape at that time. And, you know, it's when I was in junior high and high school, we still had what was called first run movies back then. I'm totally dating myself. I'm <laughs> glad people can't see how old I look. Uh, but we had first run movies and the, the new movies only played in Westwood and Hollywood. And in the Valley, we had maybe, I don't know, six or eight movie theaters, single house, except for that one that opened in the mid to late 70s in North Hollywood. They were all single house theaters. And I, as a kid, I used to go to the Studio Theater in Studio City or the Lorena Theater in Sherman Oaks, both of which are not theaters anymore. So, but there wasn't many theaters in the Valley that, you know, and the movies were old by the time that they, you know, they were sometimes five months, six months old because movies used to play. I, I can remember going to see, like I remember seeing Star Wars in 1977 and standing in a line that stretched completely around a full city block at the Cinerama Dome, which was sitting by itself in a giant parking lot back then. Uh, now there's a whole arc light complex. The entire parking lot's been turned into a shopping and movie complex and parking. But it used to just be the dome sitting by itself and literally, you know, like a thousand people in line around the block waiting for sometimes three, four or five hours to get in to go see the movie. And, you know, and you would think nothing, by the way, of doing that again, like the next day to see the same movie because because you knew 
you were never going to be able to see that movie again because it might not be on television for 15, 20 years. Mm-hmm. So, and no reserve seats. So you had to no get in line reserve, early. No, no reserve <laughs> seats. I just, you know, but it was exciting and fun. And so, you know, I used to wander Hollywood Boulevard and, and I, I remember being obsessed with the Egyptian theater and the Chinese theater and the El well, it wasn't actually even called the El Capitan. The El Capitan originally was uh, or opened as the El Capitan, but for many years it turned into what was called the Paramount Theater. They renamed it and they covered all the beautiful architecture in the, in the uh, El Capitan with just basically plain white corrugated um, cardboard or something like that. And <laughs> so years later when Disney bought the theater and they were renovating it, they pulled down all this this uh, corrugated plasterboard, they actually found all the original architecture there and turned it back into what it is now. That building actually used to be Barker's Brothers Furniture back in those days. And I they used to have an elevator, which was still fairly common around town, one of those old cage elevators where there was an elevator operator that would take you up and down, you know. Uh, it wasn't automated. And I used to sneak in there and let and just ride up and down because it was so fun to do that, you know? (laughs) And so Hollywood was, you know, just had a very dangerous tinge to it back then. And I loved it. Now, of course, I live in the Hollywood Hills in Whitley Heights near the Hollywood Bowl overlooking the boulevard. I still love Hollywood. I go down there all the time. I see movies in all those theaters still, although they've all been gentrified over the years. I don't think I ever told my parents. I mean, my mother died when I was pretty young. My father's still alive, but uh, I don't think I ever told them that I used to do that. I used to sneak into town um, and, you know, wander around <laughs> and see ho- see Hollywood. So the original film, like I, I really bought into that mystique. And I had a lot of fun working with, you know, Matt, my partner, and Rachel Goldenberg, the, the director, and Amy talking to the writer on um, recreating Hollywood of that time. And, of course, of the group, I'm the only one who was actually, like, you know, old enough to like really remember um, what it was like. And I still have so much enthusiasm for the original like Hollywood. And and, uh, so it was fun to try and figure out how we could recreate that time today. Um, And I think, you know, you'll see when you see the movie, but I think we did a really good job. I mean, to me, the movie looks like it happened. The Hollywood stuff looks really realistic to me. We'll see what you guys think. Is this a remake? I, you know, from the trailer, it looks like it's the the main character. She's she's an adult now. She's play, it's Alicia Silverstone, and um, she's reminiscing about her her old life. But I, is it based in the now or is it based in uh, in Both. the eighties? It's Both. a little There's okay. A period of the film in the now, and Alicia Silverstone plays Deborah Foreman's part as an adult. There's a period of it in the now, and the bulk of it is in the then. Um, in the in the eighties, and it is the same story. You know, it's the same story. Um, we've taken some licenses to change some things, but it, it's basically the same story. But it is now a musical. It's a full on musical film. Okay. Uh, Man- Mandy Moore, who did um, the choreography for La La Land, did our choreography. And there's, mm. I, I want to say there's twelve. I think there's twelve musical numbers. Um, Harvey Mason Jr. Uh, was the music producer, and you know there are there many of them are big full on dance numbers, and it's a jukebox musical. So the the songs are from the period, some of which are from the original movie, and some are have been added. But they're used to tell the story through through song and dance. But it is the same basic, you know, it's the same basic story. I'm not going to tell you the changes because you got to leave <laughs> something up to the imagination. <laughs> It follows the same basic story. And it reminds me, I mean, when I saw just from based on the trailer, I immediately thought of uh, 500 Days of Summer and um, and the Hollow Notes musical sequence. This was, a that movie, was fun. That, this was a movie that you did. Was this something like you, you thought, well, maybe maybe we could do this for a full movie? You what know, was that again, like? It wasn't, it wasn't my idea to make it into a musical. That was Matt's idea. So, and I don't want to take any credit from him because he, like, this was his baby. You know, I came on uh, to help with that. And uh, and certainly I, I like to think I added plenty to the mix, but it was not my idea. But I always wanted to do a musical because musicals remain one of my favorite film genres. And they always were when I was growing up. Um, I think mostly because they're just so completely escapist, you know? Um, and I, I know whenever I seen one of those movies especially growing up that no matter what was happening in my life 
for that two hours, it took me out of it. And it was kind of like a fantasy world that you wanted to live in. So, um, so, you know, I mean, I grew up in, in a time when they were still somewhat popular, although phasing out by the time I was in high school. But as a kid, you know, like movies like The Sound of Music were, you know, were very popular. I saw that many times as a child, you know, movies like My Fair Lady, uh, Grease was one of my, is still one of my all time favorites. That was a little bit more modern. Uh, Mary Poppins when I was a kid, you know, uh, these were all um, movies that, you know, that were just total fantasy. And so I always wanted to make a full on musical film. Over the years, I've made many movies that had musical sequences in them, um, 500 Days of Summer being one of them. And that was one of the more elaborate of any of the ones I've done. Um, but I like years ago, I did a movie that had three full on musical sequences in it. I had done several movies that had that kind of a component to them, but I'd never done a full on musical. And this was the first time. And so that was part of the exciting you know, factor for me wanting to be involved because uh, I wanted to see what that was like. And it was, you know, uh, it was a challenge, but, you know, <laughs> in a good way. I want to do another one. You know, I mean, it was just re really enjoyable. There was something about it, you know, it, even as a as work, it's it's, you know, it's really fun to come to work and see people dancing and singing every day, you know, take some of the stress of making a movie away. Honestly, to the, unless you're making the movie. It's not that interesting. But when you're making a musical, you have all of these days that are full of a lot of really fun visual things. So it's really great, like, to be on set because, you know, you're act something big is happening, you know. And it's complex, but a little bit of eye candy happening, much more so than many other movies that, you, that you, one makes. Holly had touched on the original locations. What about original actors? You, you're friends with Deborah Foreman. Um, any cameos? There's a, few there's a few surprises for a few minutes here and there throughout the movie is all I'm going to say right now. <laughs> Excellent. You can, you, can find, you can find them for yourself. <laughs> oh, little Easter eggs. Everybody sings for themselves in this movie. Nobody is dubbed with somebody else's voice. This is a group of really talented young actors they all sing and dance, and, and like I said, the music was produced by Harvey Mason Jr., um, um, who's done a lot of big movies like uh, Straight Out of Compton and and Sing, and he's really really talented, and and so um, a lot of the fun was just the music itself and creating that. And I know that the audiences that we've showed it to so far have really responded to the strength of the music. Um, in this. And I, I know that Interscope is releasing a uh, soundtrack on the same day, as a matter of fact. Uh, you may have seen that the original was re-released uh, on digital uh, for the first time ever a few weeks ago. And I know that there's going to be some sort of package pricing um, where you can get both movies um, <laughs> together oh, nice. um, with some sort of package pricing, So, which I think is a really great idea because um, I think it'll be fun to watch both the movies, uh, you know, back to back. Mm -hmm. Um, I think they each stand on their own in in their own individual way. But I think it's also fun to see, you know, the differences. I'm looking forward to watching the original again. The last time I watched it, <laughs> uh, we all went together as a group when we were in pre-production uh, with this film. Um, it was playing at uh, Tarantino's Theater, uh, the, the New oh, Beverly, Beverly yeah. um, in 35 millimeter. And Martha um, Coolidge was speaking afterwards. And a lot of the original cast was there. So we all went, you know, just as kind of sort of a fun thing to do. And then all hung out together afterwards as a group at El Coyote uh, uh, <laughs> across the street. Um, an L.A. icon that's the best. popular lo long before the 80s. But um, uh, when I remember when I started in the business, we I, I can remember in the early 80s going to like rap dinners after shooting with big groups of crew and cast at El Coyote. And, uh, one particular one as a young, I'm trying to think if I was even a pretty, I think I was maybe a production manager. I remember going to a, we had a dinner with the whole cast and crew after work one night, there was about 35 or 40 of us. And one by one, everybody started leaving and not leaving any money. I got stuck with the whole bill. <laughs> so I, <laughs> 
it's now it's a fond memory. I was yeah. a little uptight about it then because I, because a three or four hundred dollar bill was a lot of money to me back then. Mm. <laughs> All you have to do is have a few of their margaritas, which are yeah. super strong. It was fun though. I still remember that dinner. It was really really, really fun. A big, huge, long table out on the patio. Well, thank you so much, Stephen, for uh, for coming out. This was uh, taking time out uh, to promote this and talk with us. Um, we're really excited about the movie. This is coming out on vid- video on demand and your favorite drive-in theater, which is apparently coming yeah. back. Uh, we'll have and to get, find it. <laughs> and get the soundtrack, too, because it's a fantastic soundtrack. Love it. Very good. Oh, absolutely. Great to talk to you guys, and I hope you enjoy the movie. So that was nice. Got to talk with producer Stephen Wolf. What could top that? Maybe our chat with director Rachel Lee Goldenberg. Wonderful. Okay, so when we return, we will talk with director Rachel Lee Goldenberg of the new reimagined Valley Girl. Chegou a melhor parte do podcast. É hora de provar a melhor Coca-Cola. A Coca-Cola sem açúcar. O sabor irresistível da Coca-Cola, sem açúcar e igualmente refrescante. Coca-Cola sem açúcar. A melhor escolha. Welcome back to the What Difference Does It Make podcast, and welcome to Rachel Lee Goldenberg, the director of Valley Girl 2020. Hello. Ah, yay. <laughs> You're definitely not Adam Silver. <laughs> I'm not Adam Silver. <laughs> and you are not 70 years old. Why, why does Google tell me you're 70 years old? I have no idea. I, I, I didn't do it. I do think it's funny, and that's, <laughs> that's all I got. Okay. Well, you look great for 70. So keep it up. Yeah. Whatever whatever your yeah. diet is, it's all it's working for wait, you. Wait till I'm 100. I'm going to look great for uh, 100. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good idea. <laughs> Constantly impressing people with my youthful <laughs> youthful appearance. Wonderful. Well, 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 okay, welcome to our podcast. We're a, a 80s music po- Yeah. Uh, it's a 80s music podcast. We talk all things 80s. Valley yeah, Girl. I'm thrilled to be here. And I, I heard you guys talk to Steven. Whoa. Yeah. Yes, he was our opening act. You are our headliner. <laughs> well, Steven actually was, when I when I heard that you talked to him and I, I listened to one of the episodes and I realized he's really the perfect person to talk to because of everyone on our entire uh, cast and crew, he was the historian. He was like the guy who we'd walk around the streets of Hollywood and he'd say, well, that building came in in the late eighties. That one was the early seventies. He, he's amazing. He really has LA history down. It's pretty, it's pretty incredible. And it was a, a truly a great resource for us. Are you, you're from, you're not from here. I originally. am not from here. I'm from yeah. Massachusetts. So yeah. Not like so the it must have been at all. extra interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so they take you on a, on a road trip to, uh, to the San Fernando Valley. Did, uh, what was that like? Well, we did. We yeah, all our location scouting. He had a, he had he was helpful, especially in Hollywood, but all all around. He has he has such a great sense of of what's been happening to LA through the decades that he was like yeah, he was like a, an encyclopedia. <laughs> what drew you to this? If you were not because we're this is obviously our era, and you know we left the original. What drew you to it? Well, I was a fan of the original, but what really drew me to it was when I when I read the script that Amy Talkington had had wrote it. It um, really connected with me personally, actually, because I had sort of a similar Julie experience of growing up in suburban Massachusetts and then going to these concerts, these sort of grungy, hardcore concerts in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts. And that same experience of, yes, there were boys that I liked (laughs) and having that experience. But then the larger thing that it did for me that I think Amy really brings out in the script and that I was excited about of this is actually almost more than Julie's first love in in our film. It's like Julie realizing her life can be bigger and sort of discovering her passion and realizing that she can take control of her life and she can make it what she wants it to be. And I really very specifically remember having that feeling um, in my own, uh, in my own way, in my own late nineties way. (laughs) So that was part of it. And then also just as a director and as a musical fan, 
it's it's such a dream. There's just so many. It's it's uh, so rich with avenues of storytelling between the music and the and the, the choreography. And ha- because it's period, I mean, these separate worlds. It can be hyper designed, and so all of that stuff just made me excited to get my hands on it. You know. <laughs> Did you have to go through some sort of uh, '80s research of uh, okay, let's let's listen to the music, let's hear, uh, no, you know, I, let's I mean, see some I, of the movies. I, get- I probably even now still listen to more 80s music than anything else so the the music <laughs> fit right into what i've been, been listening to but i did do a ton of research especially i was really excited about getting um the la 80s punk scene right and we watched the decline of western civilization and i had my crew and all my designers mm. watch that and all the punk actors watch that um and we we you know and, and i and i of course, we watched a bunch of movies and pulled a million images and magazines and wanted to, to get things right and wanted it to be as accurate as possible. But it's it's not such a stretch. I feel like the, the 80s are um, such a cultural touchstone. It's not like they went away in 1991, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so... <laughs> So it wasn't such a stretch to be able to, to dig in. I'm curious about the music. How big of a decision? I mean, you must have had a lot to choose, you know, a lot to choose from. How many people were involved when it came down to the final decisions about which songs were going to make the cut? Well, so when I received the script, it had it had songs written in into the script. And then I probably with uh, Amy, the writer and Matt, the producer, we probably switched out maybe half of them. Once I got involved, I just really wanted to make sure that we earned every song. I wanted songs that I love, but not just songs that I love, songs that could work for the story and move the story forward and feel not gimmicky, but like of the movie and songs that we would have some way to remake our as our own, you know, um, so that so that it doesn't just feel like we're throwing this 80s song in, but with but it doesn't sound quite as good as you're used to it sounding because it's not, you know, because it's not Freddie Mercury or whatever. but more that we could find, you know, like, like with Under Pressure, how we did a big orchestral version of that. It was, you know, it's all about trying to find our own way into a song that is a love letter to the song that we know, but really feels specific to our movie and to the characters. And how difficult is it to direct a musical? Have you done this before? I mean, these are, these are huge setups. <laughs> did you real, did you know what you were getting into? <laughs> the short answer is very difficult. I, so funnily enough, I, the first feature I ever directed was a commissioned project that I did uh, when I was 23. I, I made a hundred thousand dollar musical for, um, for a sort of Roger Corman esque company that I worked for at the time. So I had done a musical, but this was a really, really different scale than that. And it was um, definitely challenging. I mean, I, I, I would say, especially having made a non musical since then, I, I do think it's twice as much work as uh, <laughs> to make a musical because we're producing the whole album and then, um, you know, every, every scene that has dancers and has, has our actors singing and dancing, there's just so many considerations, but it's also what's fun about it is that there's so many considerations. So there's so many decisions to get made. And you really, as a director, you really get to roll your sleeves up and dig in, (laughs) dig in deep. But yeah, I mean, even, even for, you know, for our actors who, who all luckily could, sing and dance at least to the extent that we needed them to be able to for the movie they you know they took in addition to their all their dance training they took roller skating lessons <laughs> they took dialect lessons they took singing lessons the ones who play instruments took took lessons with those instruments it felt like we were running like a college <laughs> of all these different we had a calendar full of all the classes that everyone was taking um so it was it was a, a big undertaking for sure <laughs> how long did the actual shoot take it's not so much how much did it take, it's how much did they give us that we squeezed mm. every second out of it. Um, we had 31 days to shoot, which is um, pretty fast for, for the, the scope. You know, we, uh, there'd be days where we had a full musical number and multiple scenes to shoot in a day, which uh, just on generally on larger musicals, you know, that, that doesn't happen. You usually get at least a day or a couple of days to work on a number. So it was, uh, it was extremely challenging and we really had to have a, a team that was all on the same page and really prepared. And then even with that, of course, things changed all the time. And it was, I, I would, anyone who tells you that it was a relaxing shoot is lying, <laughs> but, um, but, but you know, it, it was fun. Did you have any yeah. spe- specific eighties musicals that you had in mind, like from the past or, or not even from the eighties, maybe something, you know, in the past, did yeah, you I mean, was something that, yeah, like a touchstone or something like, let's get this feel. Yeah. Um, yeah, 
in diff- different things in different ways. I mean, you know, we, we literally for we for decline of Western civilization, we literally looked at scenes from shows for that to reference some of the punk shows. Moulin Rouge is a big one, not so much for the choreography, but for the musical style. Like that, that was sort of the inspiration for. Oh, you can take songs that everyone knows and completely regenre them and reimagine them and use them in a, a totally new way. And in fact, maybe that makes it you know more interesting and connect to people deeper than using you know as a, a straight cover. Grease is a movie I love that I, I sort of referenced in terms of really wanting a big ensemble cast so that we have our main characters. We have Randy and Julie who are the heart of it, who we're really following, but then we also get to have fun with all these side characters and they bring in levity and and texture so that we're allowed to take our main characters more seriously without the movie taking itself too seriously, which I think Grease does a great job of, of, of that. And for casting, in the way that, yeah, that or Fast Times at Ridgemont High, where it's like all every single one of those people could star in their own movie, and I would watch that movie. Mm-hmm. And so that that was, you know, part of the consideration there. <laughs> Let's go back to your adolescence. Tell us about going to the clubs and, and your kind of experience, personal experience going to, like, probably underage clubs or, you know, what? Yeah, what the punk yeah. I mean, it was just this, it was just this sort of dirty, hardcore scene <laughs> um, with, a, a you know, a, a bunch of kids who felt like outsiders and, you know, and, and my friend and I would go and, and there would, you know, be no one from our high school there, which was the most exciting part of it. <laughs> um, Cause it felt like we had this secret and, uh, and just, you know, I, I, I loved the music, but more than the music, I mean, some, and some of the music was truly horrible also, <laughs> um, but <laughs> more than the music, it was just, it just felt like there was this whole scene that was outside of, outside of what I had known and outside of what other people, you know, there wasn't because it was sort of pre internet um, or I guess the internet existed, but I think there was less awareness of how many different niche scenes there are. (laughs) Even I'm sure that was even more true in the early eighties. But for me, like I had no idea that there was this like wild scene out there until I got to experience it for myself. So it felt like this discovery and it felt like a really, to me at the time, like a really grown up thing to do to go take this initiative to do something that, other kids I knew weren't doing. And so obviously I'm trying to rebel in some way or something, but it was, um, but it was sort of eye opening that, that I could go and take this initiative to do this thing. And so that, that was, that's what was so exciting about it for me. Yeah. Like late nineties was NSYNC and Backstreet Boys. So what, yeah. so who were you into? What were, what were your bands that, uh, that you loved? Yeah, I mean, I honestly was listening to eighties music from in high school. I was, I was mainly like listening to Queen. I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, I, not that I didn't. I certainly uh, would have been excited to, you know, to meet Justin Timberlake when I was a certain age. But I still would be excited to meet him. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I was sort of listening to pop, but then felt much cooler whenever I was, you know, finding, thing, like, listening to these hardcore bands that literally, no, you know, that you've never heard of, that I, that nobody ever heard, um, that felt so much more specific and, like, a discovery. And I remember sort of, you know, feeling that way about movies, too, and just feeling like whatever was popular probably wasn't that cool, which... Is, is feels a little silly to say now because I think that just it sounds sort of teen angsty and I guess I was <laughs> teen angsty <laughs> and so it was you know it's that that feeling <laughs> I think a lot of people did go through the same thing you know you want to what you want to be associated with isn't necessarily something that you love yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. but you know but now I can get excited about pop, you know I'm a, I'm a yeah. super fan and you know so it's not, <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm, not I'm not too good for for pop culture. <laughs> did you always want to be a filmmaker? Like as soon as you graduate, did you graduate from college and then head to um, LA? Or what was did, your journey? I didn't even know that you could be a filmmaker until college. <laughs> um, it just wasn't on my radar. Like I, I love movies. And I even did watch, uh, like had access to some indie movies and was friends with people who were watching some more indie stuff. But I, I still, even with that, didn't consider, Oh, that, that can be a job that people have. People are making those movies or something. <laughs> more that I was just appreciating from afar. Um, and I, and I sort of had had this sense growing up that I was a creative person and I was so sure I was creative, but then every time I would do any sort of creative pursuit, I was terrible. <laughs> so I couldn't, couldn't paint and I couldn't draw and I would take a pottery class and be sure that this was the thing and then be terrible at that. And, um, you know, and thought maybe I'll be an actor and then was not clearly not good at that and <laughs> can't sing. And so I had all, all of these sort of like failures that, 
sort of led me to be like, oh, I guess, I guess I'm just not, I don't know. I guess I'm not good at anything. I guess that's, that's just it. And I'll go figure something out. And then in, I went to Ithaca college and sort of by, because friends were taking a film class and I wanted to take a class with my friends, I took this film class and just totally fell in love with it. And it felt like magic to me that I could create something without being able to draw or write or uh you know do do all of these sort of magical things I could sort of just put the things together and then that could be the art and that was a revelation to me that I could do that and it felt uh and and because I kind of get nerdy about logistics and stuff it actually works well with my brain my creative and logistic brain work well together with directing so that was really um and even then it took years to realize it could be a career but that was where I discovered my passion was in college and then went from there and immediately bolted to Hollywood is that what happened yeah (laughs) yeah that is what happened yeah well uh Ithaca has a semester in LA program that they do so I had (laughs) a semester here interned and had gotten my feet wet and so then when I graduated I moved out and promised my mom it would be for three months and then never, never came back. Oh, <laughs> can we ask how you got involved with the funny or die? It's also just one thing leads to another. You know, I, I was, um, when I started out and I, I knew I wanted to direct, but in the meantime was doing some assistant directing and producing on the side. And, and so someone that I had worked with on a project worked at funny or die and asked if I would come and um, work for one day and fill in for her on a project. And it was exactly when Funny or Die was blowing up. So I got there and they're like, actually, can you work tomorrow and the next day and the next day? And then just kind of got into that first as a producer and then producing and directing. And it's the kind of place that both that and the the sort of B-movie studio that I worked at before that are both the same kind of exciting, chaotic energy where there's just nonstop work happening. And so you kind of get sucked in and then a few years later come out having made a ton of stuff and like not sure what just happened. <laughs> but it, yeah, it was, a, it was a fun place to work. You got, you did the Between Two Ferns with, uh, with President Obama. Is that correct? I produced that. Yeah. I got to go, got to, go to the White House and, and yes, meet the president and shoot that. That was a, that was a, certainly a, yes, a career high, I would say. <laughs> It's pretty amazing. Let's go to back to Valley Girl in the streaming. What's the situation? Where can we find it? Yeah, how how do we find it? What's going on here? It comes out May eighth, and it'll be on all the digital platforms. And so when people ask what that means, I say um, it'll be on Amazon and Google and iTunes and Vudu and Fandango. I learned has a streaming platform. So anywhere that you can buy or rent movies, it should be available. So we just found out a couple weeks ago that Valley Girl is also going to be playing at drive-ins. So you can safely socially distance and uh, go see the film at, at one of the 40 drive-ins across the country that it's playing at in addition to the streaming options. Very fun. That seems like a really fun way to see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm thrilled because it seems like we weren't going to be able to see it on a big screen. And now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go drive and watch it in my car. Which is yeah. How how do you feel as a director if someone's watching your your movie on a phone? Because that might be happening now. Yeah, this big um, big musical production on a on a little screen. Yeah, I mean, I'm asking if you're listening and you're choosing between your phone and your computer and your TV, just watch it on the biggest screen you have. Please just watch it on the biggest screen. That said, uh, I, I will not turn down an audience member, and so yeah, however people want to watch it, I'm happy to have them watch it. I am guilty of watching things. Uh, on airplanes or my my phone that I'm sure the filmmaker wouldn't prefer. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll take the view, but if, if you're able, I would recommend just, uh, the experience on the biggest screen you can have it. It's meant to be sort of epic. I cannot wait to see it. And yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm excited for you guys to see it. Well, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Uh, really thank appreciate you. Thank you for, for having me. And I, I listened to a couple episodes and I heard the one where you were talking about Valley Girl and it's just, it's, it's, it's nice to um, have, fans excited about it embracing it we had um, maybe steven mentioned we had cameos from deborah mm-hmm. from some the original girls and um we're, it's just nice to have sort of the connection between the two movies be appreciated so as we wrap up our show with thanks to steven wolf one of the producers of valley girl and to rachel lee goldenberg the director of valley girl we want to leave you with the trailer yes we'll play the trailer as we trail on out of here and cruise down ventura boulevard So until next week, this is Dave. This is Holly. Check you later. Over and out. Hey, come on. Just tell me what happened tonight. Zach and I broke up. Oh, my God, sweetie. No, don't. Don't. Don't do any of that. We just have no idea what I'm going through. You'd be surprised. I'll tell you a story. See the people walking down the street. They don't know where they want to go, but they're walking in time. Stop. You are.
were singing and dancing on a fountain. That's how I remember it. Go, go music really makes a Where should we go now? We go over the hill to Hollywood. 